Um, I'm not going to take too long. I just have the pleasure to introduce Stephen Pentaya, um, who will attempt to respond, I think, to some details or some aspects of that uh, extraordinary um, presentation that Brian has just, has just done. And then um, we'll ask Brian to join us and to throw it open to discussion with, with you, um, as uh, uh, once we can um, start to maybe start with a discussion between us and then, and then develop it further. Um, Stephen Tentaya is a research curator at the museum and also a lecturer at the University of Hildesheim in Germany. Um, and he's working on a PhD which actually involves um, directly working with the museum as well as um, theorizing the context of the institution of, of the museum itself. Um, uh, historically, going back to Alexander Dorner as a, as a key um, inventor of museum, uh, uh, the museum field in the pre-war period, uh, and on to uh, a sort of practical experience with, with us. And he was together with um, uh, um, Diana France, uh, responsible for the time machines uh, floor of the museum, which you um, see at the, um, on the, the third floor of the museum, um, which talks particularly about recreations of, uh, of institutions or recreation of museum display possibilities within this museum, a sort of meta-museum presentation in a sense. Stephen. So, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Ryan, for this very elaborate and rich lecture that um, is so wide in its dimension that I only will respond to elements of it, and I think that in the discussion maybe we will work through some points of it uh, and see if we can somehow, um, yeah, let's say, travel again through this rich forest of ideas and see how it can sometimes connect to our particular locality here in the Netherlands or in our own practices if it comes to, uh, let's say, opening up to a bigger discussion. Um, I thought today, it's like a book I bought some time ago and which uh, I bought in a way for a particular quote which I always thought maybe one day you can use it because it's just a nice quote. And I thought maybe today is the day. It's an art history, a sociological art history written in 1916 uh, by a, a certain um, Wilhelm Hausenstein. And um, you have to excuse my horrible uh, German accent, but um, our Dutch accent in my German. And I will translate it directly and I will change one word in the quote uh, with the geo critique because I think then maybe we can grasp somehow the necessity or the urgency with which we could today approach this notion of critique. Uh, it starts with Ältere Geschlechter suchten in alle geschichtlichen states nach dem Regelungen des Individuellen, which I will sort of roughly translate by saying that older generations sort of searched in the historical all the time to say manifestations of the individual. And we so we today zoeken nach de regelingen de sociale. So we are looking for the manifestations of the social. And I would like to translate the social with maybe geocritique. So we are looking for the manifestations of geocritique. Do you have a right to such? Have we a right to such? And then he says, Jeder Zweifel wäre lächerlich in 1916. So every doubt would be laughable. Unsere Suche nach dem sociale, so our search for geocritique is not optional. Es ist nicht ein geistiger Sport. It's not like an intellectual game. Es ist eine Notwendigkeit unserer heraufdrängendes Lebensgefühl. So it's a necessity out of our upcoming sense of life. And then it comes, and I bought in a way this book for only this part of a sentence. <laughs> und wir können genau, wir können ebenso gut Selbstmord begehen, wie hier auf, ausreichen. So we could just as well commit suicide, then go out of the way. Um, I thought it was a beautiful way to start an academic survey on the sociology of art history. <laughs> and maybe it gives us an idea on how we could address, let's say, the urgency of geopolitik today. But um, enough for this uh, sort of more uh, comical opening. Um, what I took especially from this, um, from this discussion or from this lecture is these ideas of scales, or I want to start with this idea of scales so that you can go from the intimate to the regional, to the national, to the continental, to the global. And that what happens if we live our daily lives uh, is that we are constantly let's say, unconsciously programmed by the, the scales that we are not aware of at the moment. And that 
this somehow manifests itself in um, in a well. This is sort of my my response now to your to your talk, and I will sort of give this as a proposition, and maybe you can refute it or uh, complement it or or discuss nuance it. But in a way, it seems to to result in our situation today in uh, what you call then this commodification of knowledge, which is let's say still result driven or object driven sort of practice or understanding of our practice and on the other hand what I would like to call sort of a, uh, a weak form of relativity a sort of anything goes kind of relativity and I see those let's say these two formats or these two manifestations of this sort of inability to deal with these um, let's say all these different scales in which we are living our life at, at every moment and which are all the time sort of working their way through us um, manifested in, in, in these two um, these things, especially maybe today in the way in which uh, the cultural sector in the Netherlands is trying to defend its uh, public funding for the arts. And the way in which I see that, and sorry, I have to drink also water, otherwise I will dehydrate. But <laughs> the way in which I see that is that I, if I look at the way in which we are defending culture at the moment, it seems that we um, defend it very strongly with, a, with, I would say, let's say, a sort of last echo of an almost modernist logic in um, saying that we could defend it by just showing it. That if I look at the way in which cultural practitioners at the moment are defending culture, it's by saying, well, we don't give an argument why we should have culture, but we manifestate it. And this happened in my, let's say, I didn't see the entire evening, but it happened in the evening on national television recently, um, where they just showed a lot of artistic manifestations like theater, like opera, like um, music. And it is present in the, in the kind of, well, what I would say, sort of ambivalent responses that you get um, towards the, the, the argumentation of uh, that, that this, let's say, that, or in not so much argumentation, it's more like a decision, this decision that we will cut a large substantial part of this budget, um, in that you see that people all the time either resort to very, I would say, almost ancient categories of, of beauty or emotional expression or emotional depth that is felt through art, and on the other hand, the idea that we somehow should um, uh, maintain culture for the future. And that this idea that uh, there was once culture and there will be culture today because there has to be culture tomorrow. But this also sounds like an argument that feels a bit like that at the moment we just have to endure culture um, <laughs> because it will one day be very interesting and very relevant for us to look back at. <laughs> um, I never thought that this would be so funny. <laughs> no, but that in this... Um, um, in this, let's say, in these different forms, never the question is directly addressed, what is the public relevance of art for us today? And that is not really articulated in, a, let's say, a more uh, layered way. It's all the time referring to one essential category and saying that is important for society, art deals with that category, so it's produced there, and we need to produce it. And because we also come from this modernist idea that you cannot really articulate what art is, so we don't tell you what art is, but we show you what art is. If you see what art is, then you will know that you need it, and so you will buy it. Yeah? So that feels to be sort of the commodification side of the story, in a way, that is present in our own, let's say, way of cultural defense. And on the other hand, it seems also, let's say, informed by this, let's say, gentle awareness that we... Um, that we also realize that we are living in this sort of layered reality that goes from the intimate to the regional, to the national, to the continental, to the global. Um, but that that manifests in a way that we say all the time, well, there are so many perspectives on art. There are so many ways to, to, to uh, establish the value of art. And that, let's say, by saying that, we have said something. But in a way, we have just said that maybe somewhere in the world there is somebody else who also thinks that art is important for their community and they will articulate that importance in a different way. But it doesn't really say anything about what's the cultural or let's say what's the political relevance, the public relevance for art, for our society today. And so, in a way, what I take out of your um, lecture and out of this possibility of geocritique is that somehow we have to learn to understand that 
or yeah, we have to train ourselves somehow in finding ways in which we can make visible and yeah, let's say identify. Let's say we are programmed in ways that we don't really realize, but happen because we are all the time embedded in this complex reality that exists out of different layers. And I think the approach or the way to understand or to, do, to, to deal with these different forms of scaling, um, I would say it's important to, to also say that even if, let's say, the complexity of these different levels is immense, that in the end, and this is a word I very much enjoy from your lecture and also which came up, let's say, many times with all the maps, is that we are dealing with specific constellations and not with, let's say, infinite constellations, not with things that are endless and that because they are endless we can never comprehend or do anything with. I think in the end, what we should try to realize again is that even if society is complex, even if our world is complex, that from our intimate experience and our intimate embodied life, through, let's say, our observations on a global scale, all the time we are there and we can do something. And all the time we um, have the possibility to try and identify things that we don't understand and ask ourselves, is this important to me? Is this changing my life in a negative way? Is it affecting, let's say, my sense of communities, my sense of self, my sense of love, my sense of what? And I think that um, we have to be much more, I think, aggressive and explicit, and that's also a reason to read the suicide quote, um, because it feels a bit like, let's say, professional suicide if we don't try to gear up and um, uh, articulate far more precisely and far more specifically what we mean when we say that it's, there is a public relevance in funding art. There is a public relevance in art. And I think that... Um, uh, um, yeah, in this, in this attempt, or in this, let's say, in this trying to articulate it, um, I would say that one thing that we, that we should try to avoid, and this is in this, in this way, is <coughs> either saying that art is something, um, let's say, producing one identity that we should somehow, let's say, enjoy, because that feels too much like a commodified logic that says there is one, let's say, desire that we all have, and that desire that we all have will be, let's say, uh, uh, fulfilled by art. Whereas I think that we have to be much more explicit and say that we are ourselves composite subjects at the moment, and some, some, let's say, some part of our lives we're dealing with intimate and private desires, and other parts of our life we're dealing with, let's say, regional, national, continental, or global um, uh, systems that are working, and we are part of different communities that we all are acting in, and that these different communities do not all need to be treated in the same way as we treat our individual desires, because that is, I think, sort of the, the, the trick of neoliberal capitalism, mm -hmm. is that our entire worldview is somehow translated in this, it's either a commodity or it's too big to understand, let's say this weak relativism, or it's just, let's say, something that you could solve by just making it into something that you can buy. And I think that, for, for instance, for the Dutch, geographic, uh, for, for our regional, national, and maybe European, let's say, on a, on a continental scale, um, we have to realize that sometimes we talk differently, we use different vocabularies, uh, we have different possibilities, we understand ourselves to be different entities when we think of ourselves as a national, national subject than if we think of ourselves only as an individual or private subject. And I think that if we start to understand that we are operating on these different scales, and, let's say, are influencing constantly ourselves, let's say, by translations between all these different skills, um, we could perhaps break open again uh, another form of public discussion, another form of, let's say, being together and um, realizing that when we are together, we are not necessarily just living out our own, divide, uh, let's say, our own desires in a bigger community, but that we actually give up sometimes a part of, of that let's say, if those individual desires, because we also live not entirely in those desires, but also in different, maybe, desires or different layers of desire. <coughs> and so I think that this is a, um, uh, a point that we, yeah, that I take out of your lecture and that I would offer as a response, let's say, as a sort of translation of your ideas to the particular locality of, uh, of the Netherlands. 
And I think also that with that, maybe we can open the discussion and uh, let's say uh, allow you to join in.